Bruce Friedman of Adult Side Broker, and welcome to Adult Side Broker Talk, where each week we interview one of the movers and shakers of the adult industry, and we give you a tip on buying and selling websites. This week we'll be speaking with adult attorney Corey Silverstein of Silverstein Legal in part two of our interview. Adult Site Broker Talk is brought to you by Webmaster Access, September 12th through the 15th. The show will be in beautiful Cyprus at the stunning Grand Resort on the beach. Go to the events page on our website at adultsitebroker.com for a 25% discount for Adult Site Broker Talk listeners. To register, go to webmasteraccess.com. At Adult Site Broker, we're proud to announce our latest project thewaronporn.com. You'll find articles from industry websites as well as mainstream publications from around the world. It's designed to raise awareness of our industry's plight in the war on porn and the numerous attacks on our industry and online free speech by hate groups, the religious right, and politicians. You'll find all that and more at thewaronporn.com. You've probably noticed our new podcast site at adultsitebroker.com. It has a more modern look with easier navigation and more information on our guests, including their social media links. For more, go to adultsitebrokertalk.com. And we've doubled our affiliate payouts on ASB Cash. Now, when you refer sellers or buyers to us, you're going to receive 20% of our broker commission on any and all sales that result from that referral for life. Check out ASBCash.com for more details and to sign up. Now let's feature our property of the week that's for sale at Adult Site Broker. We're proud to offer an amazing opportunity. If you're in the live cams, model management, or fan site space, or want to get into any of these spaces, we have a private listing that may be just right for you. This company works with all the major cam sites and has access to hundreds of U.S.-based models. We're offering very limited information at the seller's request in order to maintain privacy. We anticipate multiple offers for this very rare listing. For more information, contact us at adultsitebroker.com. Now time for this week's interview, part two of our talk with attorney Corey Silverstein. Is it harder now to operate an adult website than it was 15 years ago? And if so, why? It's not harder. It's different. It's just 15 years ago, the issues were different. But now the reason why I would say it's more complex, because right now, as you and I are talking on, you know, May 10th, 2023, I think is the year, you know, right now, the adult entertainment industry is under a tremendous amount of government attack between FOSTA-SESTA, between age verification. And religious and private attack. Well, we can get to religion. We haven't hit religion yet, but we hit the attacks in Section 230 and the attempts to, you know, destroy Section 230. When you, when you go through all of these things, the fact is, is that right now, there are a lot of reasons why it is a lot more legally challenging to be in the adult entertainment industry because there's a lot of things that you can get in trouble for. Now, I wouldn't say, you know, some people would say, well, are we a bigger target now than we were 15 years ago? No, I don't think that's really changed. I think we were just as big of a target. I think it was actually just different. I mean, when I first started in the adult entertainment industry, we still saw the federal government pursuing obscenity prosecutions. Well, we haven't seen one of those in, in, God knows how long now. The radio station changes, but the music is still playing, so to speak. So a little bit of a different tune, but the music's never stopped. So it it's always challenging. And you have to remember that being in the adult entertainment industry, no one is forcing you to be in this industry. You're choosing to be in this industry. And it is a high risk industry. If you go into this industry thinking that, you know, we're the same as, you know, someone operating a uh car park manufacturer, you're kidding yourself. We are high risk. There is always someone who wants to bring us up and try to make the adult entertainment industry and people in it look negatively. You can look no further, as you brought up a second ago, by the far right religious movement that we're seeing. They're very loud right now. I mean, you know, not to go off on a tangent here, but but I'll be honest with you, did I ever expect in my lifetime after studying constitution law 
And frankly, being a, a what I consider to be a constitutional law attorney, did I ever expect that the Supreme Court was going to over? rule itself in terms of Roe versus Wade? Did, did I ever think that was going to happen in my lifetime? No, I never thought I was going to see that. So, you know, we're not here to talk about that today, but you've got to open your eyes and look what's going on in the world right now. There are very loud people out there who are making a lot of noise that want to make life as difficult as possible for the adult entertainment industry. And I don't agree with it. I think it's wrong. I think it's ridiculous. I'll fight it. I've, I've been fighting it my entire career. I'll, I'll I'm not going to stop at this point. Yeah, a lot of it you've done pro bono. I know. I've done a lot of you know pro bono work for different organizations. I'm very proud of that work. Any lawyer that's uh, you know tells you that they win all their cases is full of shit. I'm going to tell you that right now. <laughs> and because I've 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 lost my share of cases too, but I'm but I'm very proud of the fact that I've been able to make the argument and be able to fight for the people that deserve fighting for. And 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 I believe that in our industry. Frankly, we're the, we're, you know, I view the adult entertainment industry as the freedom fighters of the world. They're the ones out there who are, who are screaming at the top of their lungs that we want the ability to express ourselves. We want the ability to, you know, share things that other people may not agree with. That's the very notion, the very nature of, of free speech, free speech and expression. So. We're definitely on the right side of things when it comes to right and wrong. We know who's right and we know who's wrong. There's no two ways about it. Has the evolution of social media platforms forced the adult entertainment industry to reinvent itself? And if so, how? It has. It has. You can't say, no one can say in the adult entertainment industry that social media hasn't changed the game. Because ultimately, 20 years ago, a consumer really didn't have the ability to have direct interaction with an adult entertainer unless they went to a trade show or they went to a meet and greet somewhere or whatever. But now, not only is it possible, but consumers are expecting that they will have some degree of communication with adult entertainers. And if they don't get that, they will move on somewhere else because that has actually become one of the big parts of adult entertainment. Oh, yeah. Interactivity, for sure. This is another example of mainstream not understanding adult entertainment. And, you know, the example I always give to people is I have plenty of adult entertainment clients who have customers that have never seen them without their clothes on. They've never taken their tops, their bottoms off, both male and female. They've never shown any intimate part but they're doing fantastically well in the adult entertainment industry. And well, how the hell is that? Because there's different forms of adult entertainment and some of it isn't all visual. And again, this is a complete misunderstanding of adult entertainment. And it's again, a uh, it's more of a stereotype than it is a reality of the law, but social media, social media and the ability to communicate with people, you know, in the industry changed everything that it, it was a game. It was a game changer. And I'll tell you the truth. Mo- most companies that, didn't acknowledge that and didn't somehow, I wouldn't reinvent or renovate, whatever word you want to use. A lot of those, a lot of those people aren't around anymore. What do you think about social media platforms that either ban adult content or, you know, make it really difficult for adult content to be on there? It's stupid. <laughs> it's, it, 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 it's stupid. It's like you want to take sexuality and you want to hide it in a, in a dark closet down the hall so that nobody ever talks about it. No one ever sees it, but maybe it's there. It's, it's, it's pure speech suppression. And look, the fact is that major companies, they have the right to run their platforms however they want. They are not the government. People make that mistake all the time. They think that like, well, you know, my constitutional rights are protected. You know, if I'm posting on Facebook or Twitter, no, that's not correct. You're a guest in their home. You're a guest in their home and they can throw you, frankly, guests in a home have more legal rights than you do on social media because on social media, they literally can throw you off anytime they want. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Don't I know. Thank you, Mark Fuckerberg. Well, I know. I, look, I know. I, I know, Bruce, that, that at one point you actually spent some time in Facebook jail for absolutely no reason whatsoever, except you were. But they banned me and I can't even get back on with any account. And I've tried all the tricks. I look at it as that's their loss. They lost someone who who would voice his mind and voice his opinion. And if you if you ever sit down and listen to 
Mark Zuckerberg's first interviews. And I'd also like to remind everyone that originally Mark Zuckerberg's first product was basically putting pretty girls online that didn't know they were going up online to rate them based on college campuses. So, but that's okay. We'll, we'll just, you know, pretend that never happened. But, (laughs) you know, the, the, the fact is, is that when you talk about social media and you talk about platforms that, you know, Look, if you want to run a platform and you want to advertise and, and say right from the start, you know, come to our platform. And the only thing you're going to see here is conversations about religious teachings or whatever, you know, be my guess. But but if you're going to be a platform that's viewed all over the world and has billions of subscribers, suppressing someone's ability to post sexuality, adult entertainment is... It's just ridiculous and it's silly. And I, and I, and I, frankly, I think it's hypocritical because if you're a social media platform, your entire purpose is to allow people to share their ideas, their thoughts. You're not really a social media platform anymore. If you're censoring content, now you're, you're quite the opposite. Now you're only publishing the message that you want to get out there. I don't believe that, that a platform that censors content is doing a justice to the world. Now, do I believe there's certain content that has no place on social media, like like uh, hate speech and you know speech that could you know incite violence and hurt someone and, and and such? No, of course not. That sort of that sort of stuff doesn't belong there. But I was born Jewish. I grew up Jewish. I've dealt with anti-Semitism my entire life, and I've seen people post things online that you know about Jews that are sickening that I find personally absolutely offensive. But at the same time, I actually believe that they have the right to express how they feel. Now, do I disagree with it? Is it wrong? Do I think they're, you know, demented or ill or uneducated? Yeah. But that doesn't change the fact that I, I don't think that they should be prohibited from from posting it. I, I, I don't. Now, I know some will disagree with me and that's okay. But that's also one of the nice things about social media. One of the nice things about social media is that people can actually when they're using social media correctly, you can actually go on there and you can learn quite a bit. You can have very good discussions and hear views of other people, you know, for those that are actually behaving themselves. As you know, Bruce, there are a lot of people who jump on social media and seem to behave like like three-year-olds. But there's, you know, to go back to your original question, I, I, I think social media has probably been great for adult entertainment. And you say, you know, what's what's the expression? Adapt or die. And adult companies that haven't, you know, adopted the the, the potential of it, what it has to offer, and so forth. But again, they they've very much been left behind. No two ways about it. How much do you think the whole Trump thing changed social media? So here's the thing about all of that. Again, this is another person that I again I I I don't believe. You know, whether what he says I believe is right or wrong isn't the issue. I believe he should be allowed to to speak his mind. I think that he probably, because of the fact that he became the president of the United States, that obviously his audience became arguably the most attentive audience in the world. So, you know, how much did, did he change things? I think he changed things a lot, but I would also tell you that there's been other polarizing figures over the years that have been all over social media that have said things and called for, frankly, acts of violence. And yeah, do I, did, you know, do I think that Trump brought a lot of it to front page news headlines? Yes. But do I think what he was doing it was a new thing? No. But I mean, he also changed the whole discourse on social media. That was more what I was what I was getting at. Yes and no. There's been other people. There there have been historically other figures that have been silenced on social media that weren't quite as front page headline news as as someone as powerful as the president of the United States. And so he changed things because of who he is and who his position was. But was he unique? Was he the was he the first person to you know say things that may not have been true on social media? No. There's been plenty of others. Did he, you know, did he abuse social media platforms to the benefit of, you know, winning an election? Yeah, he probably did. But to be completely candid with you here, Bruce, I I believe that politicians have been doing that since the beginning of social media. So they've been doing things like that even before social media existed. They did it with the normal media. Do you think as a free speech attorney, do you think he should have been kicked off of Twitter? No, I really don't. I had a feeling that that was going to be the answer. Yeah. 
I again, this has nothing. This has nothing to do with whether I agree with that, what he had to say or not. That's that's not the point here. I'm not here to debate. You know whether the president's a good guy or a bad guy. You know what? I'll I'll leave that to to everyone else to kill each other on social media over. That's their business. But 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 ultimately, you know, should he have been silenced? No. But as we talked about before, Twitter's a private platform. They can do whatever the hell they want. And now Elon Musk is, you know, it's no longer a publicly traded company. Elon Musk can do whatever the hell he wants with it. If Elon Musk tomorrow wants to ban everyone on his site who ever uh, mentioned the number four again, he can do it. And he just might. <laughs> Knowing that guy, he just well, might. Listen, I'm, listen, listen, I'm sorry, folks, but that, but these social media platforms are, they are not the U.S. government. They are private and public companies and they can make their own rules and you're using it as a privilege. You, you have no right to use social media platforms. As I said before, you're in their house. And, and look, I can even, I can even use you as an example, Bruce. I don't think you should have been off thrown, thrown off Facebook, but do you really have a say in it? Nope. I don't even know why. It was an algorithm and I don't think the person even reviewed it. And there is no legal requirement that they ever tell you why you were thrown off. None at all. They don't ever have to. They don't have to ever talk to you again, which they probably won't. But that's their loss. No, and I won't talk to them. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's their loss. You should probably stop calling Mark at home. He's probably getting annoyed with that. So you might want to cut that out. Uh, I suppose. I suppose. I've left him some doozies of messages, though. So you regularly attend and speak at the trade shows across the world, as we referred to before. Is the bang for your buck still there? At trade shows? You know, here's here's the thing with trade shows. Trade shows can actually be very expensive. You got to always look at the, the total cost of a, of a trade show. And when I say the total cost, you need to consider travel, staying, eating, entertainment, meetings. But also you've got to think about the time away from your family, the time you're on the road. And the time away from your business, too. Time away from your business. There's a lot of things you really have to consider. Trade shows are always going to be, I believe, a trade show, whether it's good or bad, will be what you make of it. You can go to a trade show that is relatively small and come away with it with a ton of business leads. Or you can go to a trade show that's relatively large and come away with nothing. I think there's a huge misunderstanding where people seem to think that the size of the show is what matters the most. And it's not, it's actually, and then some people will even say, well, it, it also depends on what the quality of the people that are. I think that's wrong too. I think that you have to go in and you have to do your homework. I think that you need to analyze, okay, who's going to be there? Where's the show going to be? What are my goals to get out of it? And then you work your goals. And if once you get to the show, it changes, then you, you adapt. But you know, there's also some trade shows that, that, you know, historically have been very large. And this isn't isolated to the adult entertainment industry. It's, it's to the entire IT field. There, there's some huge trade shows out there that they brag about having, you know, 10,000 attendees and stuff and so forth. And, and I think they suck. Like some of the affiliate shows that have, have been known to have 10,000, 20,000 people. A successful show isn't you going home with a giant bag of free shit. <laughs> I don't bring back anything anymore, man, except maybe a cute shirt for my wife. That's not how you judge a trade show. You judge a trade show by what you get out of it. If you, if you leave a trade show and the cost of the trade show was less than what you walk away with, you win. And that doesn't necessarily have to be immediate. That's another thing that people mistake. People leave a trade show and they think that results have to be instantaneous. No. I mean, listen, when I first went to trade shows, I, you know, I, I wandered around lost, not knowing what the hell I was doing. That's, that's <laughs> every, everybody's, you know, first couple of trade shows. It takes time. And, and, you know, again, though, you got to pick and choose too. I, I think that the trade show industry got a little carried away before COVID, to, to be completely honest with you. Uh, I think there were far too many of them. I thought it got ridiculous. The fact that there was two or three trade shows in a month was really starting to get absurd. And a lot of people you know, felt like the need, like they had to go there. It's the, it's the same thing with the, the award shows. Like, I'll be honest with you. I think award shows are awesome. I think they're really cool. I think it's great to, to award them. But you know, it gets to the point where, you know, there's an award show 
every three weeks. And, and you're like, all right, it kind of takes away from the significance. I used to joke about this all the time. Cause when I was growing up and I don't know, I don't know if you, you grew up in this era, Bruce, but you're a little older than me. But when I grew up watching MTV, MTV showed music videos all day long, like actual mu- music. Videos. They don't show music videos anymore. Now on MTV, it's all, you know, programs with people jumping off of platforms into buckets of shit and whatever they do. <laughs> but you know, when I was watching, it was funny. Cause like, there'd be like the once a year, there'd be like the MTV music awards. And this was big, man. This was big. And, you know, even like after the MTV Music Awards, the, a CD or a cassette tape from my era would get released with like, you know, the songs that were at the MTV Music Awards. Well, you know, after that, it got like, oh, well, a lot of people watch it. So let's have the MTV Video Music Awards. Let's have the MTV Movie Video Awards. Let's have the MTV TV Movie Video Awards. And they kept adding and adding and adding and adding to the point where it's just like, okay, we get it. There's 17 different award shows for the same brand. So, I, you know, again, I, I, I don't think more award shows, more trade shows is the answer. And, and I do think that the bang for your buck is still there, but I think that people need to be, be smart about it, you know? And, and if someone puts on a bad show, if some organization throws a bad show, it doesn't, you don't have to support it again. You're not obliged. You're not obliged to go. No, you're right. You're right. I agree. I completely agree. Listen, I've been to some terrible shows where thousands of people were promised and there was less than 100 people there. Yeah, I can think of one. <laughs> I, there, I, there's been more than a couple. And I, I've also been to trade shows where you get there and if you want to get a cup of coffee, you got to wait in line for four and a half hours because there's so many people there. You, you got to make it worth your own while. And if you're, if you're not, don't spend the money on it. You wrote an article, which was one of the better articles you've written, and you, you write a lot of good articles. and. It was about etiquette at trade shows. If you were to put that into just a few quick points for people listening, because I think it's really important, what would those be? That was actually, so trade show etiquette was a, was a special series I did for Expos Magazine. And we, we actually did parts one, two, and I believe I did a part three. I think it's actually a three-part series. Yeah, I think it's a three-part series. But it was like, it was, some of the stuff was just like, asinine that, that 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 I couldn't believe that people were doing. Like to give you an example, people were showing up to trade shows and they were, I know this is going to sound crazy, Bruce, but they were improperly dressed. They were dressed like bums. They weren't uh, sanitary. They, they, frankly, they smelled, they were dirty. And I'm thinking to myself, who the hell is going to do, bit- what are you spending all this money to come to a trade show when you're presenting yourself like that? There were people that come to trade trade shows without business cards. And, and I thought this was the stupid, the stupidest thing in the world. I'm like, so how is anyone going to, if someone's going to meet 25 different people and you can't even give them a three inch by four inch piece of paper that has your contact information on it, like, come on. And the, and the caveat today, by the way, since that was a few years ago is obviously there are also digital business cards that are acceptable, but yes, have something. I mean, you can download an app and make a business card in two minutes now, but I still think, I still think physical business cards are good, but anyway, continue. So then another thing was the, the, the partying. Okay. And this is like, this is a big thing. Listen, I get it. There's a lot of parties. There's a lot of fun stuff that goes on in trade shows. I'm totally all about it, but I'm going to tell you something. I can remember every person that I've ever seen drunk off their ass acting a fool at a trade show and i and you remember it forever Uh oh i did that once do you (laughs) you don't ever forget it no you're there to do business as a prime you're there to network there's nothing wrong with having fun there's nothing wrong about having some drinks and going to a party there's something very wrong if you're walking around the next day and you don't remember the night before (laughs) and you look like someone just kicked the shit out of you and I remember a show, this is years ago. I'm not going to mention the show because it's not necessary. But I was at a show where there were two idiots. And these two numbskulls were so drunk that one of them literally, well, one of them was sitting down on a, a bus bench. The other guy walked up to him and literally kicked him in the head, like kicked him in the skull. Oh, my God. And he's laughing and whatever. The one guy, of course, got, you know, once he got off the bus, he was arrested and charged. It was insane. And. You know, for those of you old timers in the industry who are listening to this, you might even remember who it was. But I never forgot that. And every time I think about the guy now, that's all I think about. 
I, I, I can never picture him in any sort of business atmosphere. You know, you show up to a trade show and you're, and you're acting like that or, or you know, the, this nonsense with doing drugs. And, and this is a business show, my friends. And people will remember that forever. You're wandering around falling on your face drunk. You're not going to leave a very good impression. And, and to be honest with you, you're probably not going to make very many business contacts. Free booze isn't free. I learned that at a very early stage in the industry. Bruce, there's nothing free in this world. Nothing. And and there, there are those that will tell you that, oh, no, there's the air is free. I'm like, no, it's not. Everything costs. There's a price to pay for everything in this world. That's that's the reality. But that's a great question. And, and for those that haven't read that series of articles, they should go back and take, take a look. Yeah, I even asked you if I could post them on my blog. And you said, nope, XBiz owns it. I went, ah, damn. But maybe one of these days I'll have you do a guest post for me because our blog's gotten very active. I, you know, I think you could probably reach out to the good folks at XBiz. And I, if you linked to their uh, stuff, I don't think they'd have that big of a, a problem with it. Yeah. Now that some time has gone by, that's a great idea because I'd love to have it on our site. I really, really would. But we should talk about guest posts uh, at some point. So do you expect the current trend of state laws related to age verification to continue? Yes. For right now, the answer to that question is yes. But we've had a good development because a lawsuit has been filed now challenging the constitutionality uh, of the Utah law. My hope is, is that challenge will be successful and that will actually be the, the first domino to drop the rest of them. So I, I'm actually hoping we're, we're going to be nearing some resolution to that. Now, the only problem is, is the, the U.S. judicial system moves very slowly. Constitutional challenges take time as, you know, for those of you that have, are listening that have been in the business for a long time, you know that the Free Speech Coalition's challenge against 2257 went on for, I think it was nine years or 10 years or something like that. So it takes a long time. Yeah, and it's and it's hurting people's businesses now. There's sites like Pornhub who have turned themselves off in Louisiana, at least, and I think maybe Utah. Uh, yeah, that, that's what my understanding is too. But I, I um, the funny thing is, is I kind of like the fact that they're, Telling this, the, you know, these states like, okay, you want to go explain to your citizens why no adult, no consenting adult, not any person can access adult entertainment in, in, in my state. And, you know, here's the, the names of the senators and the legislators to go talk to. It's not going to kill Pornhub's business. It's just a blip. I tend to think that what they did was pretty okay by me, but I'm not Pornhub, so that's up to them. But, you know, it doesn't change the fact, though, that, you know, I'm hoping this constitutional challenge will kind of slow this nonsense down because again i i don't know how many more times i can say this the u.s supreme court has already ruled on this issue and the fact that the states are now doing this and basically just completely ignoring the u.s supreme court is wrong it doesn't surprise me though because every generation says this bruce they all say that i've never seen politics like this it's never been this bad i've never seen it before talk to your parents talk to your grandparents about this and everyone will have you know various different stories and yeah, you go back to the McCarthy era. Did, was it ever worse than that? You're an educated man. Some would say no. The, the one thing that people always say is they say, well, you know, with history, we want to learn from our mistakes. And that's one of the biggest things in history. But no, we don't. In politics, no. Well, and these politicians, they're making short term points. And really, that's all they care about is the next election. Well, it's, that's the name of the game. They're politicians. Name of the game in politics is, is real simple. Stay in power, stay in power, stay in power. That's it. That works very well into the next question. We're headed into another election cycle in the U.S. Should the industry be concerned? We got to watch this one. Um, the reason why we got to watch this one is because, look, ultimately, right now, things in the United States anyway are not very good. You know, gas prices are at all-time highs. Inflation is at an all-time high. Uh, you see for higher signs on virtually every business everywhere. And at the same time, people are complaining. It, it, it's kind of interesting because you've got people complaining they can't get a job. And at the same time, business is saying there's no people to hire. So it, it's a very weird time. Um, but when you see a combination of that with bad inflation numbers, the stock market has been dog shit now for however long you know it, it's been. Uh, the COVID recovery has been terrible. We could be looking at some pretty substantial change in this next election. You could see a lot of, you know, is it possible that we could have a, I call it basically a super Republican 
majority. When I say super Republican, I mean that they will have the Supreme Court, the presidency, the Senate, and the House of Representatives. It is possible. Um, it, it, it's actually very possible just because people are very upset with the way things are going. Now, historically speaking, Republicans have not been great for the adult entertainment industry. The, tr- the you know, the, the Trump administration didn't really, frankly, care all that much about adult entertainment. Trump's a fan. <laughs> well, yes, but but he was the president that signed on to FOSTA SESTA. So he he did actually. Yeah, I know. I was somewhat joking. Yeah, but look who the senator was who who really got that law going. It was Harris, who's the vice president now. We have no friends in Washington. This particular election cycle, people should be watching because the real possibility of us getting a very far right, uh, complete empowered government is a possibility. And historically speaking, that that's not been good for the adult entertainment industry. No, not at all. So during COVID, you created adult.law. What's that all about and how can it benefit people and companies in the adult space? Adult.law was, you know, during COVID, like many other people, I had a lot of downtime. I wasn't going to live court as much. I was spending a lot more time in the office and I was talking to a lot more people than I previously had the time to talk to. And one of the things that kept coming out was performers specifically saying that, you know, they didn't feel that they had access to legal education for what they considered to be more affordable prices. So what I did was I actually kept talking to performers. I talked to a ton of performers during this time. And I created Adult.Law. What Adult.Law is, is it's a subscription-based platform. So it's not like hiring a conventional lawyer where you have to pay a big retainer and and so forth. Adult.Law, you pay as you want the services. And Adult.Law is filled with educational videos about different topics in the adult entertainment industry. And we have resources, including articles. And depending on what package you subscribe to, you can get individual legal time with me. So adult.law was basically a brainchild for let's, I wanted to give performers equal access to uh, adult education at affordable prices. So I'm very proud of adult.law. We were very busy making videos. It's, it's a lot of work. And as you know, with this podcast, it's a ton of work, but I'm very grateful to the adult.law subscribers and a lot of the performers that have been very supportive of, of me and, and the platform. But the platform itself, is it, it's for performers. It's for performers that are looking for education. They're looking for access to legal resources. What about small site owners too? Yeah, you know, the education component is great for small site owners, but for small site owners, I, you know, I, I think really conventional legal representation is a little bit better, but I do actually have quite a few businesses that have signed up and, and they utilize adult a lot because by subscribing to adult a lot, we also give discounts for our hourly rates and you get a certain number of hours per, per month in legal consulting time. So some businesses have actually been a little smarter than I was and they've been taking advantage of it a little bit, but, but that's okay. That that's okay. It's all, you know, in, in the adult entertainment arena, that, that it's all in good spirit. So, but it's a great platform. I'm really proud of it. And hopefully the signups and memberships will continue to grow. And everyone after this podcast, should look at that. What are some major pieces of advice you find yourself giving to the majority of your clients? Well, right now it's a, you know, right now it's a tough one. And, and one of the biggest pieces of advice I'm telling everyone to do is to slow the hell down, slow down, stop racing. Don't go 8,000 miles a minute because when you go 8,000 miles a minute, you're going to miss something. Um, but there are so many things that you can do when you start off in the adult entertainment industry. One of the things I always tell people to do to start off with right away is form an entity, whether it's an LLC, a corporation, and don't just stick to your local jurisdiction. A lot of people think that just because you live in, you know, the state of Arkansas, you have to file, you have to create your company in Arkansas. That's completely untrue. There are states out there that provide a far better corporate uh, layout and landscape for people in the adult entertainment industry. So Delaware is fantastic. Wyoming's fantastic. Those are my two, those are my two favorite right now. One of my least favorite, which you'll probably be, you'll find this amusing, is actually California. I'm shocked. I used to have a corporation in California. Believe me, I know. I actually think, you know, in in my opinion, California is one of the worst places in the world to to create adult entertainment. As much as they want to proclaim themselves as being liberal and 
free and whatever. Um, I, I think their their employment laws are ridiculous. I think their reporting laws are ridiculous. And when adult people jumping to adult who immediately are like, oh, well, we should be in California. That is the wrong decision. That is the wrong decision. You should be considering all your other options before you're thinking about California. Uh, I, I think the state of California has done a horrific job in terms of being friendly to the adult entertainment industry. It is actually one of the least friendly places, in my opinion. Look at the condom laws. Well, you can, it's not just that. It's everything. Their employment law, their, 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 the condom laws, AB5, age verification. I can go on and on and on. It's, it, it's in, in my opinion, it's a horrible place for adult entertainment. Yeah, it's one of the few liberal states that passed uh, age verification. And again, this is just another reason why it's, in my opinion, it's, it's a terrible place to be. Last question. Any thoughts on crypto and blockchain and adult entertainment? You got to be paying attention. I mean, crypto and blockchain, I, I believe it is the future. I, you know, my personal belief is that even though it's growing, we're still a little ways away from mass adaptation simply because it's still a little bit tricky to use and people are still afraid of it. But I believe that if you are an adult entertainment company and you are not already accepting crypto or making plans to accept crypto and learning and potentially utilizing blockchain technology, you will be left in the dust in the next five years. Okay. Well, Corey, I'd like to thank you for being our guest today on Adult Site Broker Talk, and I hope we'll have a chance to do this again soon. The pleasure's all mine, and uh, keep it up, Bruce. I, I, I'm, I'm just as much of a fan of your uh, series as, as it is a pleasure to be here today. Thank you. My broker tip today is part seven of how to buy a site. Last week, we talked about the agreement and escrow. So now you own the website. What do you do now? The first thing you should do is make sure you understand everything about the operation of the site. The previous owner will hopefully be available for a period of time to help you with this. As I mentioned last week, you should establish what the former owner's participation will be after the sale. You'll need to deal with production of new content, processing, paying affiliates, and many other things. If you don't have experience in these areas, you may want to consider using our general consulting firm, Adult Business Consulting. You can get more information on what this company does at adultbusinessconsulting.com. We help website owners project manage and guide them to the right vendors. Maybe the previous owner had all the right elements, processing, hosting, payments, production, scripts, etc., or maybe they didn't. We can help evaluate that for you. Let us know if we can help. Anyway, you'll now be operating the website. If you don't have someone like our general consulting firm to help, evaluate all of those items and everything the site is spending money on and using to operate the site. Make sure you're getting a good deal and that these companies are providing the right service and check to see if you can do better. Hosting is a great example on something where people are often both overpaying and not getting the right service. Many times a server is just too slow. If you have any questions about any of this, feel free to reach out to us on our site. Next week, we'll talk about how to sell a website. Adult Site Broker Talk has been brought to you by Webmaster Access, September 12th through the 15th. The show will be in beautiful Cyprus at the stunning Grand Resort on the beach. Go to the events page on our website at adultsitebroker.com for a 25% discount for Adult Site Broker Talk listeners. To register, go to webmasteraccess.com. Next week, we'll be speaking with Peter Jensen of Rocket Fuel. And that's it for this week's Adult Site Broker Talk. I'd once again like to thank my guest, Corey Silverstein. Talk to you again next week on Adult Site Broker Talk. I'm Bruce Friedman.